banks continue to explore blockchain use cases as the crypto market grapples with one of the industry's hidden secrets. We cover all this right now in the Collective Shift weekly recap, actionable insights, and a breakdown into the crypto market, all in under 30 minutes. Nick, how are you this week? Uh, yeah, I'm really good. Uh, keen to get stuck into it. No groundbreaking news, but I think just a lot of news with big, you know, payment organizations that are stuck continuing to dip their toes into crypto, as we saw last week with the names of, you know, PayPal and Robinhood. Yeah, absolutely. I think we could be set for a really big ending to this year as we get into some of these stories that are laying the foundations. But before that, we'll get into a market update and really just going over, you know, some major movements from last week. We saw Bitcoin sort of having some volatility around the time of the uh, situations in the Middle East really uh, escalating. And it has since sort of corrected those losses initially and it is now up oh well slightly down 1.3 percent for the week but it has come up uh, over sunday and monday as well so it's up around 64,000 us dollars at the moment um ultimately while that momentum is is still decent in terms of the past 30 days up nearly 20 percent um, at the end of the day we're still seven months into this range of between 54,000 and 72,000. So nothing to get too excited about just yet, but even ETH slightly down, down by 4% in the past week and Solana at a similar percentage there as well. Uh, but let's get into it, starting with, um, I guess the biggest moves that, the biggest news that moved the markets, as I said, um, the unfortunate news in the Middle East there, uh, really, yeah, impacting markets and the commodity markets as well. Um, and then also, you know, we saw, saw CPI data as well is sort of coming out this week, which, you know, I've seen some commentary about. But I think the main thing to watch with the US inflation data is it's becoming more and more like just into the background in terms of its importance. Um, so, so long as there's no major, I guess, um, unexpectedly sort of high inflation, uh, then I think the markets will continue to not really uh, be impacted too much by inflation. But it's always worth a watch. So that comes out on October the 10th. Um, but yeah, I'll get up on my screen here as well before I hand over to you, Nick. Uh, just a really good graphic that we covered in last week's newsletter. This one was from BlackRock and it, it does show Bitcoin's history in response to these these major geopolitical events and macro events. And in the past 60 days or the 60 days after the event, as you can see on the screen there, and we may link to this in the show notes, uh, Bitcoin by far is the strongest or you know, fastest horse, as they say, the, the strongest to react uh, to any events. Um, so look, we'll see if that happens again after this uh, news that came out last week. But really, I think Bitcoin's identity continues to sort of mold. And at the moment, I think many people would say it's a hedge against just, you know, things going really chaotic in the macro in the macro economy and almost a hedge against the dilution of a lot of money printing, which it's always um, been well known for. So we just continue to watch how, how Bitcoin is identified. And, and that was just something I wanted to touch on here. But let's hand over to you, Nick, with uh, one of the biggest news from the past week. Yeah, I think this one happened just as we went to publish our newsletter, actually. Uh, Swift, which is one of the biggest kind of interbank, it's like a settlement or a messaging layer for a lot of the global banking system, how a lot of financial transactions do get routed through, especially when we're talking about cross-border payments. So they're a huge conglomerate there and they've come out and released a little bit of a snippet explaining we should expect to see um, possibly trialing of digital assets and currency transactions in the next year and into 2025. So really excited to see um, global banks potentially being allowed to use some sort of layer that swift is using to connect um, or you know support digital asset or cryptocurrency transactions so really important um, they've actually been linked a lot to projects like chainlink who have been working on kind of helping i think swift transfer a lot of these crypto assets so it doesn't come as much of a surprise really and kind of doubles down on what we've started to see with you know big names like chainlink working with Swift and supporting this type of behavior. It's unclear though exactly if it's gonna use public blockchains or permission blockchains. That's probably gonna be the biggest thing. Um, it'd be very uh, widely perceived as bullish if they do use things like Ethereum, Avalanche, and other public, or Solana, other public blockchains. Uh, would be a bit of a real disappointment if they just use some uh, centralized um, permissioned blockchains like the JP Morgan's uh, private blockchain, for example. So really positive news though, Matt, and I'm not sure if you've got anything more to add to that, but really excited to see exactly if they, 
if they're going to support public blockchains into 2025 and exactly which ones, because that's always the biggest toll of, you know, at the ground level, which blockchains do they want to support? Yeah, for sure. I think as we've been saying over the months, you know, I think Ethereum is always the go-to for these if they are going to go on a public blockchain. And you would expect that to be the same uh, with something like Swift, which, yeah, has been trialing blockchain technology, for, so I think it's since 2017. So um, it's good to see them progressing here. And yeah, absolutely one worth watching. Why is this particularly significant? I think it's just, yeah, as you said, the just how much of a juggernaut Swift is in terms of being the backbone of a lot of the, I guess, global financial system in a way. Um, and yeah, we'll continue to see, you know, news come out of them. Um, and relatedly, we saw, uh, well, ANZ announced last week that they are pleased to be joining the, I guess, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is essentially their central bank. Um, so they've had this pilot uh, called Project Guardian uh, that has been running for, yeah, a number of years now. Uh, a lot of different blockchains, well, well, different projects have announced like different pilots they've done under Project Guardian and ANZ now becoming Australia's first bank to to join that um, sort of, yeah, organization or association. Um, and they will continue to, you know, work with Chainlink Labs and ADDX. Um, and they'll explore interoperability between private blockchains and to exchange tokenized real world assets such as commercial paper. So as we've always said, it always starts with private blockchains when any institutions getting involved with this stuff. And the hope is that they then uh, go onto public blockchains. And as we've said long before, Chainlink is sort of seen as the bridge between private and public blockchains. So with their CCIP, uh, which we've talked about a lot with members over the years. So we may even see more news come out of Chainlink in relation to this particular announcement from ANZ. Uh, and I'd also be expecting more from Chainlink at the end of this month when SmartCon is on. I believe it's a two-day conference, October 30th to October 31st. And that is Chainlink's main annual conference. So, yeah, again, this announcement out now is uh, yeah, a nice little tease, hopefully, for, for more announcements coming out of that. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh we really looking forward to SmartCon, and I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see some really big announcements there. Uh, the thing, one of the things that caught my eye was uh, the SEC. We always talk about the SEC, unfortunately. It's kind of a meme at this point. Um, I never would have thought I'd have so much coverage on the SEC before, but uh, I noticed that their director of SEC Enforcement Division kind of had a sudden departure from the agency. Uh, I wonder whether this was a coincidence or whether it's part of... Uh, something, I think, bigger story here, because as we know that the SEC, as we talked about, I think in last week's pod, uh, we had a lot of the five commissioners come together and face a bit of a grilling, and especially Gary Gensler, on the way that the SEC has regulated the crypto market. Uh, it was a really explosive hearing. We saw a lot of pressure on Gary Gensler, who's the chair, but now we're seeing the director there. He's kind of suddenly stepped down, and I'm seeing a few takes here saying that it's kind of relatively uncommon for such a big figure to make such a quick exit. So, you know, this could be a personal matter or, you know, there could be something deeper here because we know that SEC has been extremely harsh on the crypto uh, sector. And I just saw a tweet today, actually, that really resonated with me, um, which basically just said that um, under Gary Gensler, that they've kind of showed a willingness to sue a lot of crypto projects that actually create value and return value to token holders. And this is whether this is true or not may have resulted in a real acceleration of things like meme coins, things that don't have any value and now starting to actually get adopted more, whereas projects that could actually send revenues to their um, users or to the holder base are you know, flagged as securities and will face you know, the wrath of the SEC. So it's this weird dynamic that we're in at the moment. And I wonder if there's anything to this story. And I'm sure if there is, we might hear it in the coming weeks. Yeah, for sure. And if, as a reminder, I think we've talked about the election outcome, very important for who heads the SEC into the future, um, whether if Trump wins, widely expected that Gary Gensler will be moved on and a new SEC chair will come in. Um, and also if Harris wins, it's still unknown whether, whether Gensler will stay on uh, as chair, which of course has major implications for the future of, of crypto, really. Um, that's not even really being, being exaggerated. That's not really exaggerating given the state of play uh, in 2024. Uh, but sort of related to US, I guess, regulatory developments, uh, that can impact crypto. We saw last week uh, a, a judgment come out with a prediction market startup called Kelshi. Uh, it's K-A-L-S-H-I for anyone listening. 
Uh, they're now able to offer markets on sort of the US election, essentially. Um, so that was sort of permitted by uh, an appeals court, or more or less. Um, and now that has been seen as a big sort of development in, I guess, US betting markets and prediction markets. Uh, because as we know, uh, I believe poly market isn't available in, in the US. Uh, could be wrong there. Um, but that was one of been that has been one of the driving forces of poly markets growth has been I guess that global uh, adoption push given they didn't want to disrupt things too much in the US so if things continue to go in favor uh, of these similar like startups like Kelshi in the US that may be a move for for poly market to really start to gain some additional market share and, and who knows if those rumors are true that they're also looking to launch a token um, you could see it get pretty well, pretty hairy, I guess, quickly, but also it could be a catalyst to spur some more deeper conversations and passionate conversations about, you know, who actually dictates or governs whether poly market is allowed uh, to launch a token, given it's arguably one of crypto's most uh, quote unquote successful projects in terms of, you know, that whole mass adoption sort of metric. Yeah, I'm really excited to see whether the token's going to happen or not. I know we talk about whether it's going to be like an open sea situation of they were, didn't you know, issue a token, which they probably could have. Uh, we're probably going to see the similar thing with Drift, another Solana-based protocol that you know is ramping up their election efforts. And we saw other market makers look to offer similar prediction markets in the future. So I think it's going to be a narrative that's only going to continue to gain a lot of weight and potentially see if Polymarket can hang on and actually keep people on the platform after the election. Because as we know, election is the biggest thing in betting markets. And we'll see if there's actually tangible use for prediction markets after this. I also saw that um, Robinhood uh, opened their crypto transfers in Europe. So it kind of goes along the similar theme of what we saw with PayPal expanding their crypto services. We talked, I think, in the last couple of pods about Visa, their tokenized um, mm -hmm. offering that they actually have a, now a stable coin that's going to be building on that um, Visa tokenized platform. And now we're seeing big name like Robinhood start to open up crypto transfers now historically you couldn't actually transfer in and out of Robinhood and now they're starting to really open that up to their European client base so you know high level here is big names just continue to build and kind of expand their crypto services which is very encouraging to see yeah for sure I think it's almost like these financial services companies and asset managers are trying to get in quickly before potential banks are allowed to get involved in crypto that was a take I sort of heard recently on another podcast i can't remember where it was from but i was like yeah that's a great point um given banks are yeah annoyed by things like sab 121 that we have been talking about that they can't really get too much heavily involved in providing these auxiliary services to crypto companies and just people who want to invest safely and in a familiar way into crypto uh, right now you're seeing the fintechs and and asset managers like franklin templeton and whatnot uh, really, you know, take up a lot of the, I guess, the initial interest there. So that competitive dynamic will be will be interesting moving forward, especially if the banks are allowed to play as well. That'll, <laughs> yeah, really take competition to a new level. But in the meantime, uh, we'll get into some of our biggest altcoin news from the past week because I feel like consistent in September, we've seen a lot more altcoin news relative to sort of industry news and um, that was very much the same last week so maybe nick kick things off with uh, xrp here yeah xrp really in the headlines for two big reasons so sec is appealing their case against um ripple unfortunately everyone that was looking forward to an end to this case uh, probably has to wait a lot longer and into 2025 because yeah they're appealing it and they're basically saying that the the result goes against other different court hearings and um, judgments that were made so uh, it looks like sec looking to challenge especially i think the notion around that it, the secondary sales weren't securities so a lot more i think we're going to hear on this s um from the ssc on xrp uh, but probably the bigger news here really is that bitwise filed an xrp trust and registration statement for an etf so bitwise who really helped champion a lot of the ethereum etfs and get the bitcoin etf going they've come out and looking to issue one for XRP. So I wonder if this is gonna be anything tied um, to the SC court case too, and to really really show that maybe you know, XRP deserves um, uh, ETF itself. Um, we know that we're pretty, um, not bearish, but I guess concerned over XRP in general. I still really struggle to see why um, you know, there's real fundamental demand for something like XRP when 
you have all these other blockchains that are booming across the ecosystem. And I haven't really um, heard many of the actual adoption stories at the real end, apart from what they really claimed a couple of years ago. So, um, but po positive nonetheless, if you're an XRP holder with the ETF, uh, I did know though that XRP did fall a bit on the news that the SEC was appealing the case. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nick. I think uh, we did actually say, I remember at the time of the, the, the perceived win for, for uh, Ripple Labs, we did say that it's likely the SEC would appeal and that has been what happened. But I think going back to that, uh, that court decision, it was sort of a mixed, yeah, it was a mixed bag. But most of the things, most of the decisions went in favor of Ripple Labs. And it looks like SEC is really nitpicking at the ones that, that they think they could still get an edge over. So that will yeah, definitely drag out uh, for years, years to come maybe <laughs> at least one year i reckon um but yeah xrp down 17 percent on on the week to to ram home what you were what you just uh said there nick but in terms of um you know other major altcoin news from the past week uh yeah it was another week and another sort of headline grabbing week for for well sui and aptos uh sort of perceived as the next gen blockchains uh, and they're continuing to just be in all the headlines, particularly Sui. But we'll start off with Aptos. Uh, and they had Frankl Franklin Templeton, so one of the world's largest asset managers, uh, announcing that they would expand uh, their their products, their, their on-chain product, which has been gaining uh, quite a bit of usage and, and traction. So that is their US government money fund. Um, that's the FOBXX is the acronym there. And they've been working on this for a number of years. And uh, Aptos is, I think, the sixth or seventh blockchain that this is now available on. So, yeah, uh, Franklin Templeton looking to expand to the Aptos chain here. Uh, and then we also got news from Sui that they launched a native bridge to Ethereum. So that's really important. Um, something, again, which is just very making it as easy as possible for Ethereum-based users to come across to Sui without having to use some third-party sort of you know, project that they've never really heard of, some sort of bridges. There's, there are bridges, many third-party bridges to and from Sui and, and Ethereum, but having a native one is like so much more, uh, less intimidating, I suppose, um, for for most users, I would, I would suspect. So yeah, another another uh, update and improvement there for for sui and that continues to really climb up the ranks in terms of total value locked so by us dollars yeah it wasn't long ago where i think it was even a month ago it was under 1 billion in terms of total value locked so that's us dollars and um it's now up to about 1.3 or 1.4 um in that metric and that is now pushed it up to yeah about eighth spot in terms of like all blockchains whether those are layer ones or layer two blockchains so we now up to eighth in the rankings uh, by total value locked. So as we've said many times, that's driven a lot because of incentives. So, you know, people are moving over to the SUI ecosystem because different projects are saying, hey, we'll give you these subsidized uh, returns that are temporary, but hey, it's, almost, it's essentially free money, uh, more or less. Um, not, not quite you know, exactly free money, but you still get these bonuses if you're willing to put in the time. Um, and Sui is being obviously gaining and a lot of people have been, I guess, following that incentive and we can see Sui climbing up the ranks here. So yeah, everything going well at the moment for Sui and we'll see if that can, they can sustain that, that growth or retain those new users is, is the most important thing to be watching moving forward. Yeah, for context too, that uh, Sui had about, I think, 340 million of total value locked as of August 7. So about you know that's we're we're a good um two months. two months on now and that you know that that's totally skyrocketed now so huge amount of capital inflowing to Sui in a really short amount of time when you look at the chart uh, I saw a quick one here is Trump um, you know the Trump they opened up the World Liberty Financial whitelist so this was the cryptocurrency that is associated and, and really backed and advised by the Trump camp. They've got a lot of Trump advisors and, and the Trump team have a very active role in promoting it and working with a few other builders to create this product. Uh, this is only available to sophisticated investors. So we talked about this in one of our newsletters two weeks ago. So uh, maybe we can attach that one in the show notes if you do want to get a quick TLDR and understand of exactly what this is and 
what well, Liberty Financial does. Um, it's a bit of a spoiler alert. We're still trying to work it out. So uh, that was the main conclusion I came to that a lot of people still are unclear exactly how it's going to work. But uh, essentially, it's just trying to create um, a very easy way to use DeFi and connect different services. So it looks like they're going to be using Aave as a really key source of liquidity and borrow and lending and borrowing markets and try to create, a, I think, a usable layer to engage with those services. So, yeah, if you are a sophisticated investor, something to look forward to. But, you know, I'm still remain pretty skeptical that Trump is they've actually went ahead with this, you know, just a month out from the election. And you know, no doubt we'll probably hear more about it. And especially if a Trump wins, who knows what's going to happen with World Liberty Financial after the election. Yeah, that's the most interesting case that I'm uh, waiting for in, in the event that Trump wins. Um, yeah, I had to do like a, a double or triple take of this tweet when I saw it just to make sure it wasn't a, you know, a, a fake one like when I saw this last week. But yeah, here we are with a, <laughs> the presidential candidate promoting, I guess, the whitelist uh, is open for a, for a new project. So it's a world we are living in. But on to, uh, I guess, another uh, just as controversial of a project or, or topic, I suppose, was yeah, really the talk of the town last week with uh, Celestia and Eigenlayer sort of getting caught up in, in yeah, what I said off the top of the show. It is, it is one of the industry's, I guess, darkest secrets or most hidden secrets um, that more retail investors, that m- not many retail investors honestly even know exists, uh, which is unfortunate. But what we're talking about here is, uh, well, any proof of stake blockchain, um, you know, you can you put in your, your amount of capital, um, and get staking rewards for contributing to the network's security and helping it all run smoothly, and then you get compensated by taking on that risk. Um, what we have here is an industry where you, investors are often allowed to use their vested or locked up tokens. So if I'm a venture capital firm like Polychain, as I got on my screen here, if I go and support the Celestia team when they were building way before they had a token, I invested you know $10 million into them, um, you know, years ago, and now the token's gone live October 31st last year. Um, and now I, as Polychain, am sort of bound to a vesting schedule. I might have three or four years where I don't have my tier, my tier tokens fully accessible until four years down the line um, with a one year cliff uh, so that they don't, I don't get any until after that first 12 months. However, and this is the big, most important thing here, as Polychain, I'm able to uh, stake, uh, yeah, essentially stake my locked amount that I'm in the future going to be entitled to. And I can continue to, I can earn staking rewards from that. And those staking rewards are liquid. So I can take those staking rewards and go to exchanges or market makers and sell them. Um, And you may think, yeah, I, I just think like intuitively, I think it just makes sense that Yes, these venture firms should be allowed to stake for things like supporting the network and stuff, but it just seems like the most common sense thing for those staking rewards to just be in association with the vesting schedule. So like, if you're using your locked tokens to earn rewards, it just doesn't, doesn't feel right that you're able to then sell those rewards. Um, and I think many people on Twitter and social media are arriving at the same conclusion. Like this is one of the benefits of smart contracts in a way that you should be able to programmatically put in these vesting schedules on these locked tokens. Yes, it's an extra lift for engineers and, and that a bit more resources for the team, but you avoid situations like this, which I've got up on my screen here with some on-chain sleuths sort of figuring out that, hey, Polychain, again, in this case, Polychain, but many other VC firms are doing the same thing. They invested $20 million and they've already actually already essentially realized their return in quadruple that return in just in staking rewards tokens. Um, so I think it's widely known that the seed round for Celestia was like one cent per tier token. I think the next tier up was 10 cents per tier token. And then the last round they did uh, was I think around 80 to uh, to a dollar per token. And tier at the time recording is about uh, five or six dollars so just selling those rewards you could see as you can see on your screen here just how much you can you can just realize a significant gain by selling rewards and essentially dumping them onto the free market because the public documentation says that you can so i say that it's a dark hidden secret of the industry however i must be fair and say that the documentation in, at least in my 
experience over my whole journey in crypto is that the documentation from what i can remember every single time says that this is allowed <laughs> it's just no one does their own research or at least does it does the their research to an extent where they see you know it I admittedly pretty buried down in the docs that that you know vesting locked or unlocked tokens can be staked and the rewards from that can be sold um so to be fair to the projects they do technically state it but yeah my gosh do they do it do they, do they do a shocking job of i guess elevating it and making it known to everyone which some people may say is, is a deliberate sort of thing which i can understand that argument too but yeah what are, what are your thoughts on this very controversial heated topic nick I think it just brings up like the low hanging fruit for like when we talk about people in a regular industry, this is like the the most obvious thing that you know we should be promoting. Um, fair transparency. I, I even saw in was it the in the Middle East in I'm not sure if it was Dubai or another Middle Eastern country, but they actually recently updated their transparency um, requirements for whether you're an influencer you know, talking about a project or you're a builder. So they're actually making positive steps. But, you know, these things about exactly when did VCs get in, what happens to lock tokens, this vesting, you actually at the moment have to actually pay sometimes for something called token unlocks. So you have to pay to find that information out. That You shouldn't really have to pay to find key information like token supply and token inflation or anything to, you know, to that matter out. You should be able to have that freely available to you so you can make the most educated you know, choice and in you know trade possible, which at the moment unfortunately isn't the case. That's you know something I would like to see if you know finally the industry is regulated. That hey, we have these fair disclosures and fair transparent outlines of token supplies, which at the moment it's kind of related to you know the project into it themselves. Yeah, for sure. And with the eigenlayer one, like what what was the actual news that came out? It was, I think it was just a collective realization that like oh wow like. There is a lot of stake tokens here, uh, but the, the actual circulating supply is like so, oh, well, relatively small. I think looking on CoinGecko at the moment, circulating supply is, uh, yeah, about a bit more. I would say about 11, yeah, 11 or 12% of total supply. Uh, so there's about 186 million Eigen tokens in circulation. As you can see on the screen there, there's actually 242 Eigen tokens that are staked. So already that is a bit of oh, a red flag, probably for lack of a better term, or more just something to be like, okay, something's, something weird is going on here that there's more tokens staked than the actual circulating supply. But I think really, like, in it's not unfortunate. Like, it's great that this news has come out. I just think I, for Eigenlayer and Celestia, uh, like, on their own, I think it was unfortunate in a way for them that they got, they copped the blow of what has been going on for multiple years, like, I'm not even like exaggerating. This has gone on for multiple years that investors have been getting away with this in, in a sense or retail investors haven't known about this, but I think they're both happening more or less at the same time in, in different ways. That really, I suppose, helped elevate it, which is which is really good, like a really good outcome. Um, but I think to bash Eigenlayer and to bash Celestia and not other projects, I think it is unfair, um, but certainly that both projects could have, should have done a, a much, much better job of being more upfront about it. But overall, a great outcome um, and a good learning curve for a lot of uh, investors to know this. Yeah, well put, Matt. Um, so, you know, maybe we, we'll have more to hear on that front too, because I'm sure we'll have formal statements from the organizations in the next, you know, week or so. Uh, but maybe pivoting to things to look forward to, I'm definitely looking forward to this HBO documentary that's airing or should you know should be airing by the time this goes live on october 8th and they're looking into the and identifying the real identity of bitcoin's pseudonymous creator satoshi nakamoto so huge one here i'm really excited to watch i'll definitely be tuning into this i uh, have to work out how to get hbo subscription <laughs> maybe i might see if they've got some good good tally to watch as well but poly market have some good odds on this actually they've got uh, 42% with uh, Len Sasselman. He's probably been identified as who they're going to identify in the documentary. You know, of course, this this is someone who died. He worked on Bitcoin previously, but then died and kind of correlated with when Satoshi stopped talking on a lot of the Bitcoin forums. Uh, then we got a really long tail of names after that with the names of Hal Finney, Adam Back, Nick Zabo, 
uh, and, a few, and a few other crazier ones. I'm not sure who's putting money on Elon Musk here, but that's got 300,000 of volume, apparently. Uh, and then 30% is the next, I think, likely outcome of other or multiple parties. So, yeah, fun one to look forward to. And you might have to place your bets on poly market to see who you've got as you know, HBO's identified Satoshi. Yeah, Daxi, that was, a, that was a great one to look forward to. What I love about the wording, I've got the poly market odds up on my screen here. Um, I like What I like about the wording, if I was betting on this, it's that all you need to rely on is just what is the HBO doc identifying as Satoshi. So it's sort of, you're just taking their word, like, because I could see this getting very complicated if there's then they, uh, they identify it and people are pushing back, oh, it's not actually them, but this is strictly what the market is for. So who is the documentary going to identify? Um, so we will get an answer, I so, I so, to put it another way, which is, which is exciting. So yeah, good, good spot there. And uh, other things to look forward to as well. Uh, there's an upcoming court case with uh, the Tornado Cash co-founder who, as we know, has been uh, in, imprisoned, uh, well, temporarily, uh, and they have now got a court case coming up. I believe their case was, or their appeal was uh, rejected as I'm just getting up my screen. Did you look at this one, Nick? Uh, yeah, essentially uh, the, you know, the founder, co-founder of uh, Roman Storm, he's just that he will be facing trial and the, his um, you know, appeal was kind of rejected. So it's going to go to head to court. So that, that's really the key theme here is one of the biggest court cases that potentially a lot of people are overlooking. All the focus has been on Coinbase, on Consensus and MetaMask, and then on possibly Uniswap if they get uh, subpoenaed uh, or sued by the SEC. But you know, Tornado Cash, huge one here because it's going to really define you know who is responsible for creating things on smart contract platforms, which is huge, <laughs> huge implications and, and precedent setting here. Um, I'm kind of um, thinking it may be tough, you know, for this, you know, for Roman Storm, just because they did have a token. Um, so in a way, they did get financial upside in people who were using it for illicit activities because they were directly benefiting from that if they bought and sold the token because they did tokenize. That's probably the only thing that really I struggle to see how they can get out of, in you know, especially when it goes to court, but huge one here and you know we're going to be finding out a lot on you know who's responsible for creating things on public blockchains oh, we'll cover that one for sure i think uh coming up is also we'll do our rapid fire sort of over and under appreciated uh i realize we have got a bit over time on this one but i did just want to break down that investing our schedule uh it's just such an important thing to to cover so uh we will finish things off though uh and i've got this week as my, um, what would I say, it's underappreciated, is Mist and Labs. So the team behind Sui, uh, a lot of them have come out of Facebook or, or, and they were the builders of the Libra or DM blockchain. Um, they're now working on a second project, essentially, um, which, I yeah, I just totally missed, to be honest. Uh, but it was, was announced in June, the testnet, and now they've updated, released the white paper for that. Uh, in September, I believe. So yeah, I've got it up on my screen. We'll link to the announcement of the white paper, but it's essentially oh, a, a very high level. I have not like dug into it too much myself, but it seems like a competitor to something like um, Filecoin or, or even Arweave sort of, or, or Arweave or even its AO uh, protocol. But I need to do a bit more digging into this one. But the fact, why is this, why do I want to bring this up just very quickly is, well, they have a new token as well that is being tied to this like independent network. Um, and my, my suspicion or I think what is most likely is that SUI stakers, I would expect would get some sort of, whether it's an airdrop or if it's not an airdrop, it will be some opportunity to participate in maybe the distribution of the WAL token. Uh, so I think that could also be a reason why SUI has really been outperforming recently uh, as anticipation of this project comes up. But yeah, it was rather unique rather than seeing like an ecosystem project in SUI coming up and, and sort of pioneering this new project. Instead, it's actually like, the Ethereum Foundation equivalent or Solana Labs equivalent actually being like, hey, we're going to make this new project. Um, so look, something to, to keep a watch out for. And yeah, Walrus, uh, we will link to that in the show notes. Uh, perfect one there, Matt. Uh, mine is from a different angle here on a regulatory angle. So the uh, CFTC in the US, they actually had a subcommittee that recommended using tokenized shares uh, as collateral. So the likes of BlackRock's build fund or any other tokenized 
on-chain money market fund that potentially could be used uh, and rehypothecated as collateral. So this is really important because as we know, one of the biggest promises for crypto is interoperability and you know backing and using all these different tokenized assets in different ways. So if this goes ahead by the end of the year and you're able to get you know, BlackRock's build fund or other tokenized assets that can be used as collateral and on public blockchains, that one's going to be pretty significant in, you know, just further developing the ecosystem out as that's going to be a huge, would be a huge requirement for a lot more TradFi organizations and sophisticated actors to get involved if they can really use this stuff as collateral on chain and then not just on chain, but then outside in, in the TradFi world. And, you know, these things are more legitimized as actual real things that have value and real collateral. Yeah, thanks there, Nick. And the article here saying that, yeah, as you said, subcommittee has sent it to the full committee. Um, so we'll sort of await, we'll see what the next step really will be um, and that the recommendations will become you know known as well um, sometime soon. So yeah, good pick up there. And as we said at the top of the show, not really any major, you know, huge news this week, but definitely a lot of like foundational like news that you can see is sort of setting the foundation for like, you know, things to come. Um, so that's where we'll leave it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. If you are looking for more insights, see our revamped weekly shift newsletter, providing free weekly market insights every Friday. Subscribe at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter.